all the cloud and all the AI and all the tech and all the data in the world don't matter a hill of beans if we are not improving the risk situation for our end and short. Hey guys, this is Insurance Insider and Insights at IBM. Our guest today is Mark McLaughlin, the Global Insurance Director at IBM. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. All right, thanks, Robin. Great to see you. I was thinking about how can we get um, most of your knowledge in a fun way. That's why I organized a raffle about topics and you may decide if they are hot or not. All right, so topic number one is AI, hot or not? AI, absolutely hot. I think that one's pretty obvious, right? Uh, where is it being hot, though, is the interesting part. We're seeing insurers using AI to do a couple of different things, right? One is ingestion of non-discrete data, drone footage, video inventories of a home, you know, uh, suggestions for call center practices, and, you know, analyzing voice, analyzing video, trying to figure out how to, you know, optimize the insurance process and give you better advice about risk. All right. Number two. Okay, wearables and IoT, hot or not? Well, it must be pretty hot, I'm wearing one, right? I, <laughs> you know, I think insurers are looking to do some interesting things in IoT. Not all of them are on board, right? Some of them say, well, it's a lot of money and I don't see the savings. But you're seeing some new and interesting value propositions, right? The reason I wear this watch is because it was given to me by my employer. And the reason for that is that in the US, you know, large employers like IBM self-insure their healthcare. And so it's to the IBM's best interest to keep me productive and healthy. And so they gave me this and encouraged me through premium discounts to meditate, you know, 30 times a year and walk and, and run and show workouts yeah. and all these things. And that's kind of the value proposition and why it's hot. You use IoT and wearables data to not only connect with the customer in a more frequent way, but to manage the risk and help them sort of reduce their risk and make them their lives better and make your life more profitable. It works for everyone. All right. So that's definitely a hot. Let's go for the next one, which is 5G. Hot or not? 5G. Not hot. A lot of interest, a lot of tire kicking going on, but I think 5G is one of those technologies that is going to take a little longer to actually sort of impact the industry than I think people are thinking. All right, next one. Quantum computing. Hold Quantum. On. Future. Not hot right now, but coming. Again, a lot of tire kicking. We have insurers actually picking up IBM's quantum capabilities today in an experimental mode. And I think quantum has, has great potential to, to make some industry change in two key areas. One is the uh, impact of quantum on cryptography, right? There's a, a lot of concern among insurers that are thinking about security practices or writing cyber risks. They say, what happens if quantum ends up, you know, making current, you know, security re regimes obsolete? And that's absolutely a valid worry, right? We have research working on quantum proof cryptography you know, as a out adjunct to the work we're doing in the quantum space. Quantum has great potential to solve kind of very broad, you know, sparsely populated data problems, you know, very high compute problems in really different ways, right? I, insurers struggle with catastrophe planning and yeah. scenario analysis in that space. It's very compute intense right now. There, I think there will be solutions that, that change that game in quantum. You know, are they three years out or 10 years out, I think is the question. I think there'll be different, it's sort of like AI, there'll be different styles of problem that used to be really hard and then all of a sudden will be easy and that's where the change happens, but we're not what, there yet. What's not easy is our next uh, raffle um, thing. So we have, ooh, automation, hot. Automation, hot. very hot right now, particularly in COVID-19 sort of, you know, pandemic style conditions. A lot of economic stress, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of emphasis in trying to get humans, you know, sort of out of certain parts of the process or reduced and, and having them do more in other areas, right? Automation is a great way to do that, right? You can, you know, take out some costs uh, quickly and you can, you know, sort of reevaluate sort of how humans add value to the risk. 
process and to insurance. But the automation is changing. Uh, it used to be uh, fill out the form and screen, screen scraping and RPA. Now it's more intelligent workflow. Help me manage an entire process through intelligence. Help me figure out that this claim, you know, is a broken windshield and we know exactly how much that's going to cost and just pay it. This claim is associated with somebody that we believe to be fraudulent and has some other markers that look fraudulent. Let's route that to SIU. All right. One more thing. Uh, we have one last one. The box is empty. No more buzzwords to judge except the last one. Ooh, a good one. Blockchain, hot or not? Uh, hot in spots. You know, blockchain had a, had a lot of interest and was in the tire kicking phase a couple of years ago. And we've seen the industry try to convene networks and, you know, with sort of mixed bags of success, right? You know, where you're trying to do something new with blockchain, I think is challenging. Where the interesting things are happening in insurance is connection to an existing network in a new way. So I look at the work, you know, we're doing with Trade Lens. We have something on the order of 60, 65% of the world's shipping now goes through the Trade Lens blockchain that we built with Maersk and, and are now have other partners on as well. And, you know, how does insurance play in that? It's kind of an interesting question, right? Can I take a certificate of insurance and embed it in the blockchain so people don't have to look for that? Can I get claims data out of the blockchain so I can adjudicate claims more quickly, maybe using automation, right? And can I write new styles of policy, right? Can I take a sensor that's tied to a shipment of bananas as it's going through the shipment chain and identify if the banana spoiled, when did the temperature get above where it was supposed to be? Who had custody at that exact time? And how do I build a smart contract that automatically finds that entity for spoiling the bananas? If I could do those things, I could write fundamentally different you know, policies on that shipment. And so you know, insurers are trying to figure out how to connect to these existing networks, food trust, trust your supplier, you know, our open IDL work with AIS in North America, pulling data together for regulatory calls, right? There's a lot of different interesting use cases going. I think, and I think the audience agrees that you surely deserve the digital scouting teddy bear that says, <laughs> love me and insurance for answering these questions, hot or not, it's already on its way to your home. So my daughter will think that that's hot. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Imagine you would take over an insurance carrier. How would your hundred first hundred days look like? And what would be uh, like your five steps you would do? First thing I would do is think holistically, right? Think about how does the, the enterprise evolve into a world, into a, a future state where it can navigate the change that's coming in the world. We're not sure at this point whether pandemic's going to be perennial or whether it's going to go away tomorrow. We're not sure what the economy is going to do. Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? You know, is, are we going to go drive ourselves broke with all the, all the pandemic subsidy or is the market going to go to 40,000? Who knows, right? There's a lot of variability there. And there's variability in, in, in how people react kind of to the post-COVID world, right? Will they go back to face-to-face -to -face interactions or will they remain digital, right? Will, will risks change? Lots of problems. So you got to think holistically about what's the future state in terms of how do I build my technology? How do I build my business processes? How do I build my partnerships to you know, be future-proof in that environment, to be able to adapt to a wide range of outcomes? I would avoid lock-in, right? No matter how great vendor X looks like, and that's including IBM, right? You're going to want something from some other vendors, right? And you're going to want to mix and match. And you're going to decide, change your mind in three years, or you're going to have a new business sponsor or a new IT lead who changed their mind. So you've, you need that plug and play functionality. You need, you know, the, the stick with open standards. You need to be able to build in that, you know, that flexibility that way. You have to put new capabilities in front of the customer. All of the cloud and all the AI and all of the tech and all the data in the world don't matter a hill of beans if we are not improving the risk situation for our end and short. And you know, no matter how we decide to distribute, no matter what the distributors tell us, no matter what our business relationships are, we have to be able to impact the, that end insured with better advice, more seamless interactions, more consistency and, and, and explanation, more, you know, and being able to be their risk partner. We have to be able to make that risk partnership come to life, right, with, you know, humans in the loop too, right? It's not all about automation and AI. It's about getting the humans in a spot where they're building relationship and trust and they're listening and being empathetic and, you know, they're, they're advising the customer, you know, on a frequent basis 
And then the last thing I would say is, you know, you've got to look across those systems and make sure that you are developing new capabilities in an innovative way at speed, right? How fast can you put something new into market? What really scares, I think, the insurers about the insure techs and about the Googles and the Amazons of the world is, man, they move fast. They, they try something, it fails, throw it out, do the next one, let's go blow another hundred million dollars, right? It's that, it's that kind of, you know, it's that kind of mindset. Yep. And insurers need the flexibility in IT, the flexibility in process, the flexibility in, in people to be able to, to get to that level of speed. They don't have to be insure techs, but they have to be able to react in a way that's a little closer to what they're trying to do. But if they do all those things, they will get to be a true risk partner. And that ultimately is, if I were running an insurance company, that's the thing I would be, that is my North Star. That is what I have to drive towards. Because if I have a partnership with you and you trust me to help you not only, you know, service a policy or, you know, or, or sell you a new policy, but you trust me to help you advise on how to improve your life by reducing the risk in it. That's durable. That'll last for the long haul. The Amazons and the Googles can't touch that. If you had asked me to take on a bet with you, if the global insurance industry would be able to go remotely within days or only a few weeks, I would have not taken the bet. But what that shows me actually is that the industry is way more capable than you know even people like I uh, had ever thought. I mean, I dreamt of it, but as I have thought, and my question to you is, are we actually way faster than we thought? And what does it mean for the relationship between incumbents and insurtechs? You know, insurtechs have been being a little bit ahead of the curve. So the insurers are, in one sense, are evolving towards insurtechs, but the insurtechs have advantages. They have speed. They're sort of inherently mobile. They're inherently cloud native. They can sustain major losses short term. They react very quickly. They can A-B test. They can do some really interesting things. But the insurers, you know, aren't going to be that nimble, but they have size, they have experience, they have branding, they've got the relationships with the end insureds and with the distributors. And so I don't know that it's the insure techs competing with the insurers and the insurers competing with the insure techs. Sure, there are a few disruptions out there, but we, we've done, we did in our uh, insure tech friend or foe study, we looked at all this and, and more than, you know, something like two thirds of the insure techs actually just want to optimize one little yeah. piece of insurance and then, you know, partner with or maybe get bought by one of the big insurance companies. And, and that's sort of the, the mode, I think, that the digitally fleet insurers are going to be in. It's not directly compete. It's co-opt and partner and build an ecosystem with a few of those insure techs where I as an insurer can leverage my strengths take advantage of the interactions and the cool widgets and some of the things the insure techs have provided, but do that in against a backdrop of we are going to be your risk partner. And sure, we'll, we'll, we'll write that micro insurance that's, you know, pay as you drive or the travel insurance that shows up on the website. But what we're really going to do is backstop all that too and proactively help you avoid risk in your life. And I think the insurers have unique advantage there that the insure techs or the Amazons and the Googles and the Alibabas of the world, they, they aren't going to be able to get there very quickly. And that's kind of, that's the, that's the way forward for insurers. Co-opt and be holistic and, and go after, you know, the bigger fish, which is how do I be a risk partner? That's the future. Mark, it has been a pleasure. All right, Robin, thanks as always.